This is Kim Newlove, host of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Welcome to part two of my four-part PGX Pharmacist series. Today's episode is an interview with Sue Paul. Part one featured Dan Krinsky. Part three will feature Miriam S. Yassin, a PharmD candidate from Manchester University College of Pharmacy. And part four will feature Dr. Jamie Wilkie. These interviews pull back the curtain on how these individuals got started in PGX and more. There are a lot of pharmacists out there looking to do something else. Entrepreneurship in the pharmacogenomic space is certainly an option. If you're new to the show, welcome. A little bit about me. My name is Kim Newlove, and I am a pharmacist by training, but I made a career transition to voice actor and podcast host. I was inspired by my nonverbal teenage son with autism to combine my identity as a pharmacist with my speaking voice and launch my voiceover business, The Pharmacist's Voice, in 2017. My son Craig helped me realize the power of having a voice and using it. Among other things, I narrate audiobooks for women pharmacist authors, and I provide medical narration for a range of projects, including e-learning and explainer videos. If you have a project in mind, contact me through my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. Each week, I alternate solo podcast episodes and interview shows. The solo shows are about some aspect of being a pharmacist, a voice actor, a pharmacist podcaster, or my career transition from pharmacist to voice actor and podcast host. My interview shows feature a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain so that you are inspired to use your voice too. This is episode 135, and you can find the show notes with links to anything mentioned today on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. Let me tell you a little bit more about my guest, Sue Paul, then we'll dive right into our interview. Sue Paul is a pharmacist, entrepreneur, and small business owner. She is the founder of Synergy Consulting, LLC, a concierge pharmacy service, and she co-founded two other businesses, PGX 101, a pharmacogenomic certificate training and coaching company, and Metapreneurs, an international conference and community for pharmacy entrepreneurs. Sue is active in local, state, and national professional organizations, including APHA, and also serves as vice president of the Ohio Pharmacists Foundation Board of Trustees. If you're interested in pharmacogenomics, you are going to love this episode. During our conversation, Sue shares how she got interested in PGX, how she learned the science of PGX, and more. She also tells a number of stories throughout the episode about how she's made a difference in her patients' lives using pharmacogenomics. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Sue Paul. Hi, Sue. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast again. How are you? (laughs) Great. Thanks for having me. I just appreciate our conversations, Kim. You do a great job. Thank you very much. You are only the second person to make it on the show three times. Congratulations. Wow. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) You're welcome. I believe Michelle's the only other person that made it on three times so far. Wow. That's awesome. You and Dan are my first two interviews with this series, and I would love to dive right in and ask you, how did you get into pharmacogenomics? So pharmacogenomics, I was working in a health system, so I took the traditional route. I worked retail. I worked um, in nursing homes for a while. I did independent pharmacies and then um, found myself in a hospital setting. So I was doing both retail and hospital at the same time and um, part time for each. And what I noticed, I was working, I spent several of those days in an outpatient pharmacy doing a meds to beds type program. And what I found is that the cardiologists were prescribing uh, the expensive P2Y12 inhibitors um, for our patients who had had a stent placed, some type of cardiac event, um, stent placement. And what was happening is these patients would come back to get their prescription filled and they would have these enormous copays that they were unable to uh, afford. 
And I wondered why in the world are they not using clopidogrel, which was relatively inexpensive at that point. And I fell down this rabbit hole of um, some research that I found online that, you know, clopidogrel is a prodrug. Um, 30% of the population or so cannot metabolize it to its active form. And so patients would have um, a clog in their stent. And that's why the the cardiologist just went to the other options. And so I fell down that hole. I, I learned as much as I could. There's some great free resources out there to get you started on your way. This was in 2013, 2014. And um, the Farm Gen Ed program through University of California, San Diego is really comprehensive. And once I started getting into that, it was just this whole new vocabulary and all these things to learn. And, and you know, certainly not something that I learned while I was in school. And I was able to find a lab who could do the pharmacogenomic testing. And um, I did a, you know, financial analysis and created a business plan and pitched it to the health system and the cardiologists. And they were not interested. They um, had said it wasn't a standard of care. They didn't want to incorporate it increased risk? What if they find out that they can't metabolize codeine and they're on codeine? Like I had some pushback and and that was fine. And then I ended up leaving that health system and through Synergy, which is my um, non-dispensing pharmacy, I uh, have a contract with a primary care office. And what I was seeing in that setting was a lot of mental health issues. So I pulled out that PGX card again was able to incorporate it. Um, I pitched it to them and they were they were interested in pharmacogenomics. Found a couple labs that uh, would able to serve our patients well and um, started going about four, out, four months after I started in the practice. It sounds like you had some formal education in California. You said around 2013, 2014. Is that right? So it was all online and it was, I, I just found it. It's uh, Grace Quo and her group uh, were, have received some federal funding to create this educational um, option. It's called Farm Gen Ed, um, P-H-A-R-M-G-E-N-E-D. And that was my, it, I was self-taught. Like when I started it, I was self-taught, but I had really fell down that rabbit hole. My first official training, certificate training, was four months after I started incorporating it into practice um, at the Test to Learn program, the inaugural event. I didn't realize there were actual training events out there, and that one came across my desk. I was learning as much as I could, and uh, so I definitely signed up. How did that change things for you once you got additional training at the Test to Learn program. Yeah. So I was implementing it and using it. And it made me realize that some of the certificate trainings don't, there was that missing piece implementation. So I went through a couple more certificate trainings, same thing, missing implementation. If the trainings were created, not necessarily by people using pharmacogenomics. They were teaching the science. It's great science. It's awesome. Um, however, to take that next step to actually use it in practice was missing. How did you learn how to implement pharmacogenomics in your practice? Well, I was doing it. So that it's just one of those entrepreneurial things. You just do it. So I learned as much as I could. I pitched it to the C-suite and the providers and they were on board. We did it, you know, a couple patients. We had amazing results. And we've at this point in the last six years, we've done over a thousand tests. Congratulations on your success. That I'm sure that means you're helping lots of people and that's great. Yeah. It's amazing. Part of entrepreneurship is getting curious about something and figuring it out. Would you agree with that? Yes. And, and, you know, I had zero desire to create a third business, but I recognized the gaps in, in education. Um, and so that's why we created PGX 101. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about PGX 101 right now. Uh, Dan was on the podcast and he mentioned that there's modules and that's like the written piece. And then there's the live part. Can you talk a little bit about the modules and the training and and then talk about also if that gives any sort of implementation advice too? I feel like that's something you would have been really keen on including given that you felt like that was missing when you got your education. Mm -hmm. The 12 hours online prior to our live event is the science. It's the didactic work. It's it's modules, it's readings, it's videos, it's learning 15 different types of uh, areas where pharmacogenomics is um, implemented. And then our live event, we go through some trainings, we go through some state case studies. I think that's where our value is because that's where we have the input. Uh, we bring in one of my physicians. She talks about um, how pharmacogenomics has affected her practice, her prescribing and her patients. Um, and then kind of the case scenarios. We She walks through even more case scenarios of when she uses pharmacogenomics. Um, and then she also talks just a little bit about how she uses a clinical pharmacist in, in practice. Now, what part of PGX 101 talks about implementation? And so we do talk about that in the end, and we talk about it all throughout the, the live event, like, you know, start thinking about how you're going to incorporate this. Have you thought about what prescribers you're going to um, reach out to, to partner with to do this? Have you identified patients who are going to benefit from pharmacogenomics? Have you thought about a lab that you'd like to use? What do you need more information on? Is it, you know, MTHFR deficiencies? Is it ADHD? Is it uh, opioid use disorder or mental health or cardiology. And we bring in those speakers. Um, and that's that's a little bit separate. So we do the training. And then if, if people want to dive a little further, we've created PGX 201, which is a community to walk you along. We offer one-on-one -on -one coaching um, just to get people to their next step and through any obstacles and barriers that they will encounter, not if they will. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, we all encounter those barriers to success when we first get started. You don't know until you're really getting your hands dirty and trying to help people what exactly the obstacles are going to be, whether it's billing or getting the patient buy-in. Can you talk a little bit about a success story that you've had using PGX with a, an individual patient? Oh, yeah. And we have hundreds, probably more. Um, talk about one I had last week. So we had a patient who was struggling with depression. Um, we tested her back in 2018. We got her on the right medication for her. And so uh, four years later, we uh, she ha we have a new provider. So, you know, I, I've been there, but the providers have changed. And so she was introduced to her new provider and she, and the provider comes out and said, I was not seeing the patient. I was just in the office that day. She said, um, this patient is doing okay, but she's really suffering from sexual dysfunction on her SSRI. And so I went back to the test and I said, oh, well, you should use Velazodone. Um, that has a real de decrease incident. And the doctor's like, I'm not familiar with that drug. So I was able to educate the prescriber on the medication and why it would be a good choice I was able to show her the pharmacogenomic test, which she's just being introduced to and, and what the results were and what we can do with that. And then offer um, uh, some recommendations as far as um, dosing and then how to uh, make that change in the medication for the patient. So the patient was actually on the right medicine, but she was having um, side effects that she didn't care for. Um, and so we were able to just take another peek and, and tweak it just a bit. And hopefully she's coming back to see me next month and it'll be interesting to see how she does. Well, I hope that patient gets the results that she wants. Yes, me too. Now, Sue, I've got to ask, did you get paid for that incident then? Yeah. I, I mean, I, so the way that my practice works is I get paid a daily rate, um, to help the 
physicians with whatever to see patients and then to do these types of consults. Um, and so, yes, I did get paid. Did I get paid an individual thing for that particular consultation? No, they pay me per day. Um, and so it works out really well. With my um, home patients that I have, yes, I charge, they're cash based. Um, and so I also get paid. I had one last night that um, just an amazing story of a patient having, you know, drug side effects and not. I'm able to make some some significant changes and which is going to really affect her her life and her current situation. She's unable to do anything right now, so it's exciting stuff. But yeah, I get paid separately for that and I absolutely love that. That's like part 2 of my synergy consulting. I have a non-dispensing pharmacy in the state of Ohio and I make uh, I say I have individual cash pay patients and then I've got the office based practice where they pay me. That's awesome. There's so many pharmacists out there looking to do something else. And I think this is really interesting what you're doing with your your business, where you're working at a doctor's office, but then also seeing patients at home. That is very different. It's incredibly rewarding. I worked in nursing homes for 16 years, and I thought if somebody had gotten to these patients and reviewed their meds before they needed this level of care, they probably wouldn't need to be here. And so it just is truly a passion of mine. Oh boy, there's a lot of value in your service for the patient too. I'm sure that, gosh, I I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you learn by going to a patient's home. (laughs) It's awesome. It's awesome. You know, one, one guy, he was uh, in the hospital for heart failure. I, I got to his home. There's a bag of chips on the table and they forgot to prescribe his furosemide. It wasn't there. They just didn't send in the prescription. So I was able to make that connection, educate them about some diet and lifestyle. Another patient, 87 years old, he was, I I had seen him for a Coumadin check, an INR check, and he had been always within range. All of a sudden he's in the ones. So I went to his home to figure out what the heck was going on. His gliburide and his Coumadin, both, it spilled, same colored tablet. So he was doubling up on his um, diabetes medicine and not taking his warfarin. And so just being there, yes, I could have done that if he had brought his prescriptions in. Maybe. I don't know if I would have noticed or not. Um, I, probably not because he he had filled his pill box with the wrong meds. And so I don't know that he would have brought his pillbox in. So just that extra little detail you just see when you're in their home is amazing. Yes, yes. There's something that can be learned by going to the patient's home for sure. And then do they feel more comfortable? Do you feel that connection where they're more comfortable disclosing things to you? Or they just look around their home maybe and they're like, well, how about this or how about that? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, uh, yesterday it was a a daughter of a 90 90- she'll be 91 next month, year old. And all of a sudden she's had this incredible decrease in her ADLs or activities of daily living. And she was very social. She's sitting in her room. And so just to be able to identify where the issue started and then kind of follow the medication timeline and to have medication recommendations I can make to her physician And she was just like, this was the best thing ever. She's hopeful. And the daughter told me, she's like, you've given us hope again. We thought mom was on the decline. This was it. This was the end. But um, it was a medication um, side effect that she was having. And it just, her, her doctors, she kept telling her doctors, I'm not feeling right. I'm not feeling well. And they were like, your heart rate is fine. Your blood pressure is fine. And then they just didn't have time to address it. And she didn't have a way to articulate it in a way that made them stop and say, ah, there is something really wrong here. So, But you were able to figure out what her uh, her event was, the, the event that led to the decline? Yes. Oh, good. I don't want to ask for you to give away protected health information, but yeah, that I'm sure there's a lot that's involved in figuring out the puzzle. Yes. And it's, and I love puzzles. I love word games. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it just, it's, it's just something I enjoy. 
I do too. I love strategy games. And what what's one of your favorite? Oh, I'm so addicted right now to Wordle. I can't stand it. I'm like, <laughs> it's only one a day. Are you familiar? No, my 16 year old plays that, but I have not been, uh, you know, invited to look at it yet. And I, I've heard that it is addictive and I do not need another distraction. Oh, it's only one them. a day. You can't like get sucked in. You have to oh, wait okay. 24 hours till the next word, which is why one of the reasons I like it. Well, I live under a rock. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah, you just need to Google it. Trust me, it'll pop up. My 22, I forget how old he is, 24 year old introduced me to it. Maybe he's 25. I don't know. He has Got a birthday it. coming up. <laughs> this is where I am. This Isn't that terrible? <laughs> we have four <laughs> kids in five years. And once they start changing, I'm like, oh, what age are they now? <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but I kind of, I judge my life. I, I keep track of my life by, by whole, how old my kids are. I keep track of my life by how old my kids are. I think, Okay, we went to Hawaii once upon a time. How old was Derek? How old was Craig? You know, I, I think about those things. And yeah, I'm sure you do too. It's like you you let life pass and those milestones your kids achieve are part of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Four kids in five years, Sue. Oh my golly gosh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, being a mom and being a pharmacist at the same time is a challenge. Mm-hmm. And since we're on the topic of family, Do you have any words of wisdom for any pharmacist moms out there? There's no better reward than investing in your kids. Um, Do what you need to do to be able to take the time to do that. You know, I I ran the swim and dive team for 10 years. I was a Girl Scout leader for nine years. I coached everybody's soccer teams um, and, and created a life where I made time to do that. Um, and so when, as they started leaving the nest, I found I had more and more extra time, you know, when number four turned 16 and could drive himself places and such, it's like, oh, and that's when I started birthing these other babies. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Now, did you always work full time or have you been part time? What's your mix there? So I, um, part time at several jobs. So, um, I, Definitely was the uh, area go-to person for a lot of the independent pharmacies who were on vacation and such. I had the um, nursing home gig that I was doing two to three days a week until, you know, for quite a while, which I absolutely loved because they would send me to far off places. I'd get my book on tape, my big coffee, and nobody could like puke on me or or no dirty diapers. And I was unreachable, but they were home with dad. You know, my husband was a stay at home dad. And so, um, uh, but he worked evenings uh, at, it still does at UPS part time. And so that has really been a great, uh, that, that worked for us. So that's how I was able to do all of that. You know, I haven't worried about laundry or he he cooks dinner every night because he went in at 530 or six. And that's about the time I'd get home. So if he wanted to eat, he had to cook and eat beforehand. The kids were usually fed by the time I got home and uh, that type of thing. So it was, it just worked out for us. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I know I've been part-time, pretty much part-time or not at all since my kids were born and my older of the two boys is turning 19 next month. So that means I've been, you know, part-time or not at all for almost 18 years or so. It's, it's, it's a choice, isn't it, Sue? You have to pick what works for your family. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's go back to pharmacogenomics. I love these side trips talking about Wordle and family and it's all good, Sue. I love it. But back to PGX 101. In summary, it sounds like that is teaching pharmacists and they're all pharmacists. Is that right? We have had, I I look back through, we've had an oncologist go through, we've had some genetic counselors go through, and then we've also had a handful of nurse practitioners go through, but mostly as pharmacists or pharmacy students. Okay. Well, I'll just call the PGX 101 students, students then. I won't call them PGX pharmacists. Um, The students that go through your course learn 
what they need to know about pharmacogenomics. But the implementation piece sounds like it's more part of PGX 201. Would you say that's the difference? We do start threading it, you know, in, in our PGX 101, the live training, um, creating some, you know, next action steps that they can take. But what ha- was happening afterward is people were asking us for collaborative practice agreements and a template, you know, how do I, uh, you know, what do I need to have when I'm talking to the physician? How do I uh, market to providers? Um, and so we came up with some talking points and we, you know, so we were doing this because people kept asking and we want people to be successful. We started this to educate pharmacists so they can serve patients better. And um, we were finding that they needed more and more information. And so that's the whole reason we started PGX 201, um, to walk with them along that path. 20 hours doesn't give us enough time to be able to do that, to teach them a science and uh, 100% how to A, B, C, D, E implement it. I get it. I when I I'm going to draw a parallel here because I, I love drawing parallels to things. When I went to I call it podcasting school. Listen, anybody can start a podcast. You can Google it. You can figure it out, right? But I had a certain expectation from being in voiceover that I wanted my sound to be a certain way. I wanted the the benefit to the listener to be a certain thing. So I joined the School of Podcasting. I went through a formal education, kind of like people go through PGX 101. And then once you have the podcast and you've you've started it, okay, you've achieved the, the goal, right? You've graduated from the School of Podcasting, for example. But then you start doing your podcasts. You're putting out one a week, but you still have questions. I stayed with the School of Podcasting. I still pay money to be part of the School of Podcasting because I want that mentorship. I want to go to what I call office hours for Mm -hmm. my podcasting coach. And there's an online community where we can put out questions and get answers from our coach. And I feel like PGX 201 is your version of that. Would you agree with that? 100%. That's a great parallel. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I'm sure that there is a lot of value in it for the students because you and Dan, who are the teachers, are actively using it. I know you've already talked about what you do with your business. Dan talked a little bit in his podcast interview about what he does with his. And I feel like there's a lot of value in it for the students to be able to talk to people that are practicing what they preach. Would you agree with that? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the prices for anybody that missed the interview with Dan? What's the cost of PGX 101 or the investment rather, the investment in the education? And what's the investment in PGX 201? Yeah, so uh, PGX 101 is 497. We all also offer a low cost pharmacogenomic personalized test if the attendees would like to see how the what their patients will go through. And that's part of the implementation pool that tool that we added on. Um, uh, The test to learn program actually offers uh, 23 and me as that portion of it. But um, we kind of pivoted, uh, tweaked it a little bit to actually get a PGX test. And then um, PGX 201, we have a three month version and we also, which runs uh, 297 for the three months. You can re-up if you would like, if you find value in it and would like to continue on. And then we have a year long, which is $998. What do the students choose to do typically, three months or 12 months, or is it too early to tell? We have about half and half. And then then the people who choose three months, we've had one or two drop off, and then we've had the rest stay on. So it just depends on what they need and if they're getting out of it. But they have access to all the uh, industry leader trainings that we've done once they join and such. So, you know, I'm happy to just help them fly <laughs> whatever they need. I love how encouraging you are. And you're just, I love how you nerd out about this. We were talking off mic beforehand and I asked you a question. <laughs> you're like practically shaking. You're so excited to answer this question. I was asking about a friend who had a need for uh, possibly a pharmacogenomic 
consult and I was telling her that PGX even existed because she uh, is not in medicine. Okay. And Sue was just so excited to, to answer that question for me. And thank you. I, I just love that there are people that are so passionate about what they do, that they're spreading the word to others. You are truly needed where you are to teach others and mentor them. Thank you for the important work you do. I love seeing you do it. Thank you. But it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. I mean, to take a patient who was struggling with mental health, who had addiction, who recognized that their health or the, their mood was failing again, didn't know where to turn, was on, you know, five different mental health medications to be able to offer them a test which showed that the medications that they were on did not play well with their genes to get them on the right medications and then to have them actually be able to go off their Suboxone because they finally got stable mentally, who is now practicing in her profession and just had a baby and has been off of uh, um, her medications for the last five years is I can't even tell you how rewarding and life-changing that is for her and for me and her whole entire family. Wow. That sounds like a long-term recovery that a lot of people would love to have. I hope that you're able to help other people like that because that's a story we want to hear over and over again. I get to do that every day. That's awesome. Yeah. Sue, I think as pharmacists, we all want that level of success for every single patient. We, We all want them to find what it is that they're looking for, whether it's getting their hypertension under control, getting their diabetes under control, getting into recovery after substance abuse disorder, and so on. So what I want to ask is, I know that you are an exception. Not every doctor's office has a pharmacist who knows how to do pharmacogenomics. How do we get more pharmacists in doctor's offices who know pharmacogenomics and how to implement it with patient care? Uh, that. That's my dream. That's what I've been trying to build. I've reached out to several doctor's offices. I finally hired, am hiring a pharmacist to help me so that I can spend more time on developing and networking those relationships that, you know, physicians are coming to me because of my home patients and what I've been able to do for them. And so I just have, you know, it's just me. And so Um, I am also part of our practice as part of a network, national network. Um, I want to expand to be able to put PGX trained pharmacists into those practices and then just kind of walk with them along so that they can be successful um, in helping these other patients. So, yeah, it needs to be duplicated for sure. Absolutely. Now, if there's a doctor's office somewhere in the United States. We're in Ohio, right, Sue? So let's talk about in Ohio. Maybe there's a prescriber in Ohio who wants to find, and hey, I'm in Toledo, Ohio. What if there's a prescriber in the Toledo, Ohio area who wants to get a pharmacogenomics trained pharmacist in their office? Is there a way to to connect prescribers and PGX pharmacists yet? And and that's one thing that we are adding to um, PGX 101. Um, Carol Bell came up with a great national uh, pharmacogenomic registry of um, providers who are offering pharmacogenomic services. So um, we want to put that out there, uh, take her work. She um, is, is passing that along because she didn't have an, uh, a time, enough time to properly um, build it the way that she would like to. And so we are going to assist her with that. So that, that network is being created. But for a specific physician in Toledo who would like a PGX pharmacist, we've trained so many pharmacists in Ohio. I, I can t- think of three off the top of my head right now who I can put them in touch with. Okay. I'm thinking of how can a pharmacist who's not even familiar with pharmacogenomics refer one of their own fellow pharmacists that is trained in pharmacogenomics? I recently had a request from a friend of mine who's got a few kids and one of them has ADHD. And I was saying, you know what? I'm not trained in pharmacogenomics. And I understand that your child's tried diet and behavior modifications and it's not working and they're on a 
a 36 milligram dose of Concerta and five milligrams of Ritalin at lunchtime and things just aren't going well. And you just want to see if there's something else that can help maybe changing the drug, right? But I, even though I'm a pharmacist, I don't know pharmacogenomics wise what I can do for that patient. So what I would like to do is refer them to, you know, a PGX pharmacist. So darn it, Sue, when can we get this registry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's currently being built and and it, it's coming. It's it's got a great um, base, and uh, we're working on that now. So I don't have a timeline for that. I would imagine a uh, second quarter, um, but you know, reach out to somebody who's doing pharmacogenomics. I can certainly help that mom. Um, I work, walk through a couple different steps. I check to see if their physician is knowledgeable about PGX. And then I do some education there. I can set the physician's office up with the ability to do that, or I can set the patient up with their own testing um, where, um, and then do a consult. Um, in Ohio, you know, where I'm licensed, or like I said, we've trained hundreds of pharmacists throughout the, throughout the country. I think our last one, we had 14 people, 12 different States. So most States we have somebody that has been trained at least by us. And I know there's lots of other training programs out there and that registry is really going to be helpful with that. Absolutely. What I heard you say just a minute ago, though, is that talking to somebody who's in pharmacogenomics like you would be a good start. I mean, I could even refer her to you, even though it would be a distance consult, couldn't I? Thank God for technology. That's right. Zoom is wonderful. FaceTime is great. You know, it's just there's so many options. How would a patient contact you to work with you if they did live somewhere outside your geographic area? For example, a patient in Toledo and you're in Cincinnati. We'd start with a phone call and then set up a Zoom call if, if they'd like and, you know, whatever works for them. Um, and then just just go through that process. You know, that's my love is, is helping the individual patient one on one like that. Well, it sounds like you would probably offer some sort of a 15-minute consult to see if working together is the right thing exactly. before you would, you know, go into the billing and 100%. a lengthy phone call and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be referring somebody to you. Fantastic. <laughs> I'll give her your info and it's yeah. it's on her to follow up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sue. That, I, I'm getting more out of this uh, interview today than I expected. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, when it comes to PGX 101, I know you've got a training coming up very soon. This podcast is going to be published on February 11th. Um, tell me about the next training, any deadlines, what's going on? So the next training is going to be February 26th and 27th. It's going to be virtual. Uh, you need to have the 12 hours of online training completed before that happens. And so we do make a cutoff of uh, February 12th, I believe, is the cutoff date for this one. And then we've, al we've also got another one planned for uh, April 23rd and 24th. Very good. Anything that anybody needs to know about that? You did mention that there's 12 hours of study ahead of time. Do you recommend they break that up into, you know, two hours a day or anything? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would need to. I, I'm self-diagnosed ADD. I couldn't sit in front of a thing for 12 hours and learn a whole new vocabulary and, and all that science and such. So, um, yeah, I, I do recommend breaking it up some. I'm one of those people that needs to pace myself. So I appreciate that you have a cutoff because that would really send a loud message to me. You really do need a couple of weeks to go through the material and get it done. Yes. And the beauty of our program is it has a deadline when you need to be finished. So I don't know if you've joined any programs that it was self-paced. I did a PGX program that was self-paced. And they let me know that at that time, this was a couple years ago, about 36% of the people actually finished the course. Um, I forced myself to finish um, just because I, I wanted to get to the end and see. I, I was using it more for a comparison type thing, but um, that's the beauty of P PGX 101. We've had 98% finish our course. One was uh, felt 
uh, significantly ill. And then the other one was actually the director of a health system who signed up. And then she didn't really need it, but her cons- or her employees did. And so she had kid activities and this, that, and the other, and she never did complete it. But um, everybody else has finished it. Wow, your completion rate's really good. Mm-hmm. It is. Well, it's because it's the way it's set up. Yeah. Gosh, I have an online course that I created for myself. You're giving me an idea. Maybe I should have part of it be written and then you have, you can only finish it if you show up to the live portion. That's a really good idea. It is. I mean, I thrive on deadlines. Uh, What your course is set up like reminds me a lot of the APHA immunizer course, 12 hours of written and then the eight hours of live. I remember doing something like that. And I remember opening up the packet and it said you have to read all this stuff and answer some pass a test before you can go to the live portion. And I thought, oh boy, I only have like three days to do this. Good luck to me. I had two little kids at home. Yep. But anyways, it's good that you're upfront about what your expectations are because students need to hear that. And yeah, good luck to all your students. Thanks. Now, Sue, I I know that you've got Synergy because we talked about that. You've got the PGX 101 and now PGX 201. Can we talk a little bit about Metapreneurs, which is why you've been on the podcast the other two times? What is going on with Metapreneurs? I understand you've got a huge anniversary coming up. And for anybody that's never heard of it, what is Metapreneurs and what does it do? Metapreneurs. So uh, Anna Garrett and I, uh, I had we were in a business mentoring group together and um, I had been to a couple entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurial events where, you know, it was just amazing to be around like-minded people who all had a goal of better serving patients and who learned from each other. The energy fed off each other was amazing. And so I thought, you know, I wonder if there's other pharmacists out there, who would benefit from a community. And so we created Metapreneurs. We brought in Michelle Fritch, um, and she has been a wonderful addition. And so it's this community of pharmacy entrepreneurs, mostly it's being expanded to healthcare entrepreneurs who get together and meet. And we have our annual conference. And this year is our fifth year, and it'll take place August 26th to the 28th in Cincinnati, Ohio, again, Um, that was a great venue for us last year. And so we're going to just recreate or uh, replicate that somewhat. Um, And then throughout that, we've created a community similar to PGX 201, where we have uh, the ongoing mentorship and masterminds and um, other events. And so it's become a lot more than I would have ever envisioned and um, a lot more work than I would have ever envisioned. So actually, I'm, I'm stepping away and I'm going to be on the board of advisors. Um, but I am pruning my life to you where I'm using my skill sets the best. And then, you know, I did a great job setting up conferences when I had to, but I just don't have the, the time to do that any longer. So, yeah. Well, good things evolve. And that's what I hear is happening with Metapreneurs. It's evolving. It first was just a conference. And now it's involved to something that has a membership, like you mentioned. And now you're stepping away a little bit from the planning phases of it and letting it grow in a different way. And I think that's healthy. Thanks. It's been it's been a tough decision. It's been incredibly I grieved for a couple months about that, but I know it's the best thing. And honestly, my whole journey has been um, led by God, and I feel him nudging me to take this uh, next step away, and it's in great hands. It's grown to more than I ever would have imagined, and I'm thrilled about that, and so I'm just going to let it fly. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, who's in charge now? Michelle. Very good. I definitely know Michelle. She's been on the podcast three times and I I know she does a great job with it too and she's a lot of fun too. She is. Yeah, she's a seven on the Enneagram. That that just that screams fun. 
<laughs> yep. She and I, it's funny. I think we get along so well, she and I, because she's a seven with an eight wing and I'm an Evan, sorry, I'm an eight with a seven wing. So we're, I don't know if they're mirror images of each other. I'm a little bit tougher than I am fun these days, but I think I was like her when I was younger. And then having a raising a child with a disability has turned me into an eight with a seven wing. If you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, learn about the Enneagram. And there's a great book by Ian Morgan Cron. Road back to you. I became certified. I took a certification in the Enneagram through COVID. I wanted to get through COVID with a new skill. And so that's <laughs> that and the ukulele. No way. You learned how to play the, the ukulele? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's a work in progress. Well, that is fun. <laughs> that is fun. Well, Michelle might have to compete with you for the title of the fun one. That's pretty cool. <laughs> no, nope. She, she gets that glory. I give that crown to her. It's all hers. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll put a link to that book in the show notes. I have listened to that one on audiobook, and I really enjoy that. I've, I've listened to the audiobook version of that. All right. Well, I wasn't aware that you were stepping away from metapreneurs a little bit, but I got to say, since we're talking a little bit about spirituality, I, I just wanted to say that I've noticed a theme in your life. You are a gap filler, and I really identify with that. You find a problem and you fill the gap, right? You were finding that the patients who weren't responding well to Plavix needed something else and you figured out why, right? You get curious about things, you figure it out. I personally call that being a gap filler when you figure things out and you do something with that knowledge. And also I feel like you're an Emmaus walk person, which I also am too. A lot of times I'll find somebody who wants to do something that I also am doing, or they'll find me and we'll walk together until they know enough that they can walk away and be fine. And I feel like that's a lot what you do. So I just wanted to share that with you that I really feel like I am also a gap filler and an Emmaus walk person where you just walk with somebody until they realize that, that they can do it and they, they walk away and I, I've never talked too much about spirituality on this podcast. So anybody mm -hmm. who's a non-Christian may not really understand that. But I think that um, finding people that you really share a connection with is important. And over the past five years, so you and I have had a connection, not exactly like we're best buddies or anything, but ever since I met you in April 2017 at the Ohio Pharmacists Association, I thought I need to stay connected to this person because you came out there like this bright shining light to the annual meeting of the Ohio Pharmacists Association. And you're like, I'm doing this thing. I'm doing this, you know, this, uh, this business, the synergy business where you were um, working with doctors and you were doing the pharmacogenomics and you were having a business and you were hinting that metapreneurs was going to be a thing and they were going to have a conference. And I'm like, I need to be connected to her. For anybody that also wants to be connected to Sue, what's the best way to get connected to you? Probably on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I spend the most time. I'm not on there every day. I just don't want to be <laughs> social media. That can send you some down some some uh, comparison traps, which I just hate. Um, I know that I'm on the right path for me and, and this has been an amazing journey and um, I wouldn't be able to do this without trying to listen to that inner guidance and whether it's God or spirit or source or the universe or whatever, however you want to, um, but just being obedient and following, following those nudges has served me well. Um, I'm a BS pharmacist. I should not be able to do what I get to do. I don't have a residency. I don't have board certification. Um, you know, it, it truly is a miracle. Well, I think it's pretty cool what you have done with your your professional background. I know you mentioned you don't have your, you know, board certifications. You don't have your PharmD. Same boat, girl. I am. Same thing. BS Farm 2001. And I know that I didn't do anything uh, clinical 
to get my entrepreneurship started, my business started. But still, I feel like I have enough. I can still help people. And I think that's an an important thing for anybody who's looking to do something else to hear that you are enough right now. You can take the skills that you have. You can get curious about something. You can figure it out. You can fill a gap and you can teach other people how to do it. You can walk with them until they're ready to walk by themselves. And that's the whole basis behind Metapreneurs and PGX 201 is creating that community of like-minded people to walk with you, to encourage you when it gets hard because it will get hard, um, and to ride that entrepreneurial roller coaster with you. Absolutely. Yes. And it's been fun being on the roller coaster with you, you know, um, meeting you at OPA, the annual, or, yeah, the annual meeting of the Ohio Pharmacists Association, and then I went right up to you afterwards and I said, what's this about a conference? (laughs) And you told me about metapreneurs. And then I was at the first one and then the second one and I stayed connected. We had the road trip that metapreneurs did having all these great little masterminds during the, the pandemic. And then we met again in Cincinnati and we've been connected and been on podcasts together. And again, it's been a pleasure being on the roller coaster with you. (laughs) I can say the same. It's, it's, so, it's just such a gift to me to see you blossom and take this idea and hone it and clarify it and then do it and be successful at it. You really are good at what you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to having you on the podcast so that I can share you with my audience. That's fantastic. I appreciate it. (laughs) I don't like putting myself out there. So this is kind of a good platform for me where I can share my story and not have to be all wild and crazy. And (laughs) (laughs) I know it's just chill. It's two people that have known each other for a few years, having a conversation. And then we share that with others and hoping to inspire them to use their voices too. everybody listening. I hope you feel inspired by Sue's story. Well, thank you. Appreciate you having me on. My pleasure. Well, as we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to share? Go Bengals. <laughs> I know it'll be after <laughs> after the next game and, and maybe after the Super Bowl or right before the Super Bowl, but I hope that they are there. It's been such a fun year in Cincinnati with our Cincinnati Bearcats and Bengals. <laughs> and I know you're a Browns fan. But. <laughs> hey, we're hoping to have our time sometime too. And I'm a Browns fan by marriage. Once, so I do like the Browns. I, you know, I cheer for them. But once the Browns are out of the playoff, we're rooting for the local teams, whether it's the Lions up in Detroit, which is only an hour away from me, or the Bengals down there in Cincinnati. So go Bengals. I'll say it for you. I'll be rooting for them. They're the local team. What a year, huh? What a year. Yeah. All right, Sue, thanks again for sharing how you use your voice here on the Pharmacist Voice Podcast. Take care. You too. Thank you. I really enjoyed this interview. Sue is a great guest, and it has been a pleasure having her on the show three times now. At this point, I just want to share a few final thoughts with you, then I'll wrap it up. Number one, I heard Sue say that pharmacogenomics is the most rewarding thing professionally that she has ever done. We should all be that lucky to find something that we love doing too. Congratulations, Sue. Number two, if you're interested in pharmacogenomics training, there is no time like the present. Register for the next PGX 101 training today. Literally, because registration closes tomorrow, which is February 12th, 2022. The next training after that is April 23rd and 24th, 2022. If you're listening to this in the future, both of those dates have passed, visit pgx101.com and sign up for the next available training. And number three, on a personal note, Metapreneurs has been part of my life since 2017. I heard Sue Paul hint that there was a conference for pharmacist entrepreneurs in the works when we first met at the annual meeting of the Ohio Pharmacists Association in spring 2017. I knew I wanted to stay connected with her and attend that inaugural Metapreneur Summit. I attended, and Sue and I have been popping in and out of one another's lives ever since. And it has been fun. If you feel strongly called to do something, Follow your instincts and look into it. 
Let's wrap this up. Sue Paul inspires me. She is touching lives with pharmacogenomics and serving as a role model for pharmacist entrepreneurs. I hope you are inspired by the many ways Sue Paul uses her voice. Thank you for listening to episode 135 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to read the show notes. Links to Sue Paul's LinkedIn profile, PGX 101, Synergy, Metapreneurs, and more are in the show notes. Word of mouth is still a great way to share information. So if you liked this episode, please share it with a friend and subscribe to or follow the Pharmacist Voice podcast in your favorite podcast player to get each new episode delivered to your smartphone every time a new episode comes out. Thank you again for listening.